Second, I'm going to propose on behalf of my panelists that we all think creativity is a capacity that all human beings have, that it is not some special elixir that a talented few have in some kind of abundance and that others do not have, but that it in fact is part of the innate birthright, the innate set of human skills all human beings have, but that indeed culture and socialization and social institutions can influence the development and the expression of that capacity. And so when we deal with our Uber question there about whether it can be taught, it may be more like, can it be revived? Can, how is it nurtured? How is it catalyzed in the institutions, particularly schools, that we focus on? And here's my one provocative thought. Uh, in my reading of fairly recent history, when I look at the influences that have actually changed the direction of school reform, have actually changed the direction of American schools, I read about and hear about many different influences that try to redirect and have their, their say and their influence on the shaping of American schooling. And certainly the arts have long been one of the more earnest and pitiful aspirants to really have some significant influence in school reform. In my reading of history, the single thing that seems to catalyze significant school reform in fairly recent American history is when the business sector gets afraid. Uh, I, if, if you think back to Sputnik, if you think back to a nation at risk, those were the kinds of corporate concerns that led to significant rethinking about what American schooling is for and what, we should, what, what it should be filled with. The reason I, I bring up that theory, which we probably won't need to argue, is that I think we find ourselves at a, at a kind of opportune moment in American history in that in my working with corporate uh, clients and in conferences, I get the feeling the American corporate world is getting scared again. And the kind of fear that leads to school reform. And the fear I keep hearing bubble up is the fear that Creativity, the kind of last essential advantage that American industry had over the rest of our global competitors around the world. Creativity, that entrepreneurial, irrepressible know-how to innovate. May, we may be, in fact, be losing that in, uh, corporate advantage to overseas competitors. We have lost the, you know, the manufacturing sector, we have lost perhaps the service sector, and this final advantage we have, we may be losing this as we hear about initiatives in China and India and other countries overseas wishing to really increase the creativity component of their schooling. I hear American corporations go, wait a minute, maybe we need to do something about the creativity in American schooling so that we can retain this final advantage we've got in the global so the timing, this is not just an intellectual exercise, that this topic. I hear it across the country. Uh, I don't hear it phrased, in fact, in as interesting a way as this, that I hope we can really focus the latter parts of our conversation about what, what does it mean to instruct, to inculcate, to encourage the creative capacity. But the, the conversation we're having may have some consequence. I hope this is a conversation that has ripples down to the school level and the, the school curriculum level, and it'll be valuable for me to have my ideas informed by people who know a lot more than I do, to really sharpen my own understanding of what we can bring to the ongoing conversations that contribute to the disorganized American system of school reform. That said, uh, let me turn to our three panelists in Creativity is divergent thinking. 
doesn't look like a man climbing on a rope, does it? But from the giant's point of view, it expresses something in a different way than he's accustomed to hear seeing it. So although all children have the capacity to um, see the world in a little different way than everybody else, one of the things that we do in early childhood is to socialize them so they see it the same way everybody else does. And I can use a, 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 an example that might uh, make it stand out and clear to me. Uh, many <clears throat> young children think it's fun to experiment going to the bathroom. And one of the things we teach them very early is little boys have to stand up and little girls have to sit down. Now, we do that because it is part of the culture, it's part of how we live our own lives, and in a very short time, by the time children are six, seven years old, they refuse to do anything else but that. So part of what socialization is, is teaching children to see the world the same way the adults that they live with see the world. And um, I, after this is over, you might see some of the examples of children's drawings. And when children are two and three years old, their drawings look identical across all of the various cultures. If you can go to the jungle, the Amazon jungle, the three-year-old's graphic representation looks just like a one in a school in Chicago. But by the time they're five or six years old, you can almost tell where they are being culturally by what the drawings look like. And Asian drawings look very different from Western Europe. Children who come from rural areas, their drawings look quite different from children who come from urban areas. Now, part of that is that what they see is different. In other words, what they see uh, for houses look different in different parts of the world. So part of what they're doing in the process of growing up is representing what they see. But also part of what they're doing is representing what people in their culture say they should see. So when we look, for instance, at uh, uh, Chinese children's drawings by the time they're eight, nine years old, they're looking at very uh, subtle differences in, for instance, bamboo. And you'll see them in the drawing class, and everybody's looking at bamboo and representing it. And they're looking at very, very subtle differences. Whereas in the United States, you might see kids Draw it upside down. They've been to a museum and seen modern art, and so they're being very different in their representation of the same thing. So one of the things that we do is we teach children not only what to do, but we teach children how to think about what they're doing. We call it habits of the mind. And so when you say, can you teach an adult a different habit of the mind, it would be like trying to teach me engineering might be able to do it, but it should be up to me. The habit of my mind does not run in that direction. So what I'm saying is, yes, you can teach adults to look at the world in a different way, and we all have some stretch in our ability to look at the world. But most of us get socialized into a particular time, a particular place. It is very hard to unstick us from that way of you another example. I lived for a long time in Iran, where they had traditional classical 